Last week, um, we uh, started a series on, hey, did you know? And we talked about, hey, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that God is the God of revelation? No, I got that from the fact that there was this messenger guy by the name of Gabriel, an angel, that came and appeared to Mary and uh, told Mary that uh, God was going to bless her. In fact, Mary, did you know that God is a God of favor? We saw that last time. Most of us have this, I don't know why, we have this feeling that God is out to get me. <laughs> Isn't that true? I, I, if I mess up, he's going to zap me. God didn't create us to zap us. If you read uh, the book of Genesis, God created us to bless us. He wants to favor us. In fact, God gives us unmerited favor, which means I don't earn it. It means no matter what I do, God is still good to me. It's called grace. Our Christian doctrine of grace sets us apart from every other so-called religion in the world. God is gracious. He gives us what we don't deserve. On the other hand, he's merciful. Now, mercy means he withholds from us what we do deserve. I mess up. I do deserve to be punished. Now, that's where that guilt kicks in. Oh, God's out to get me. But he withholds by mercy what I do deserve because he places all my sin and debt on Christ on the cross. He then gives me what I don't deserve, all the righteousness of Jesus Christ to my account, and it comes from believing in the Lord Jesus and confessing with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. He appears to Mary and he says, you are highly favored. It's not because she did anything in and of herself. God was just gracious to her. Mary, did you know that God is a God of miracles? He is about to do something in you, Mary, that's never been done before and never will happen again. In fact, we call it a miracle of the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. She says, how can this be that I'm going to have a child? My goodness, I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. Uh, listen, I've taken biology 101 in school, and I know how this works. How can this be? And he says, the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that what is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. God is all-powerful, omnipotent. He's going to do something in you that's never been done before and never, never be done again. For the angel went on to say, for with God nothing is impossible. Mary, did you know that God does the impossible? God does the impossible. Well, Mary then took all of this as a promise. She said, here am I, your servant. And I'd like to paraphrase the next part, what she said. Bring it on. <laughs> Let it be. Let it be. Now, this is all easy for Mary. But today I want to talk about, what about Joseph? You see, Joseph is the fiancé. How is Mary going to break the news to her fiancé? Listen, you and I have never been sexually active and uh, she's going to start to show. <laughs> Put your shoe, your, yourself in Mary's shoes for a few moments. Uh, hey, Joseph, I got to tell you what happened. The other day, this bright and shining dude showed up and he said, oh, Mary, you're really favored of all women because God is going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to place a seed inside of you so that you're going to have a baby Jesus. It's going to be a boy. And, uh, and that's why I'm starting to show. And Joseph says, right. I took biology 101 too. <laughs> you know, Mary was blessed. She's called blessed. But I want you to know when you're blessed, it doesn't mean everybody else is going to think you're so blessed. That doesn't mean everybody else is going to jump on board and your life's going to be easy. In fact, her life's going to be very difficult. 
She's going to have to flee her home. They're going to try to kill her son. People are then going to say that he's illegitimate. Uh, she's going to live with a, a cloud, a shadow over her all, her all the days of her life. She's going to watch her own son, who is the Savior, be crucified. Uh, just because you're blessed doesn't mean life is going to be easy. That's so important. That's so important. But what about Joseph? What about Joseph? How are you going to convince him, Mary? Well, we just talked about that. I don't know how she can. Maybe she's just going to hold off and not tell him at all and just let him discover it. Well, we're not told in the passage how it happened. But Joseph, did you know? And I have some questions for Joseph. Joseph, did you know that God is the, a God who works in mysterious ways? He does. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about according to Matthew chapter 1. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Now, we've got to talk about the ancient marriage process. Most marriages were arranged by parents or whoever was taking care of you. They arranged the marriage. And you usually didn't get a whole lot of say in that. Maybe you did at the house, but the parents were the ones who ultimately arranged it. And so there was a pledge process. And once the pledge was made, that contract was binding you were considered to be a husband or wife because you were pledged to be so. Not like our engagements where, oh, I got a fiancé and yeah, I still got a little bit of time to get out of this deal. No, once you were pledged, you're in. You're, you're, your, your word is your bond. Uh, you're, it's, that's it. You just haven't had the ceremony yet. And in the ceremony, you follow the ceremony, there was a ceremony before they had this event called you take the person home. <laughs> Okay, that was followed by actually having marital union. And if you were to read the Old Testament, you'd see that there was a, a little ceremony after this where the following morning, they grabbed the sheets and brought them out to show the blood stain to prove that she was a virgin. Okay, and so there's this different process than what we do today. Okay, so she, she is pledged She's in a binding contract to be married to Joseph. But the text is very careful. It says, before they came together, before there was any sexual intimacy, she is found. Ooh, I like that word, found. I don't know if Joseph found one day. Whoa, Mary, you're gaining weight. And then she spills the beans. Ah, uh, well, there was this angel. He appeared to me. You see what I'm saying? Or he's saying, you know, Mary... I got a problem here. You've been with another man. I don't know how that all went down. She's blessed. And maybe she's got some false accusations from her fiancé. She was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit, just as the text in, in Luke said, the, the angel Gabriel came and told, told her, Joseph hasn't had this vision. He hasn't had this, this appearance of an angel. He's left in the dark here. But God works in mysterious ways. You may someday be accused of a wrongdoing and you know you've done right. And everybody else thinks you've done wrong, but you know you've done right. That's where she's at. Everybody's thinking, sure, sure. So what's a righteous man going to do, Joseph? Come on, what's, what's a righteous guy do in a situation like this? Well, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he's righteous in, in two, two ways at least. One, he's righteous because he has believed God. And the Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you are declared righteous by God. We call that justification. He was a righteous man because like Abraham and like others who have believed, he, he, he was declared righteous by God and his sins were forgiven and he had a righteous standing before God. But he also was a righteous man in that he wanted to do what was right. Because that's what righteous people do. Not that we always do what is right. In fact, uh, too often we say, Lord, here I am again. I've done the same wrong thing again. And God says, because you've confessed it before. What do you mean again? I already 
forgave you of that, and I forgot about that. I've wiped it away. He was a righteous man wanting to do what was right. And by that I mean he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. You see, not only was he righteous, he was compassionate. It appears from the passage that he really loved Mary. And even though he thinks that she has been unfaithful to him, he loves her enough that he does not want to make her go through any further public humiliation by being labeled as an unfaithful, fornicating, adulterous person. So he had in mind to divorce her quietly. You see, this so-called engagement betrothal period was considered a binding marriage already. And there's only one way out of that. Death or, or the second way would be divorce. There is such a thing as a righteous divorce. Here's a righteous man seeking a divorce. And the fact that Jesus will later say in Matthew chapter 5 that there is an exception. You can get a divorce for unfaithfulness. He's got grounds for a biblical divorce. She appears to have been unfaithful. And so he's seeking a biblical divorce. The other grounds is given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you have a spouse who abandons you and just leaves and is gone, then you can be freed from such a bond, he says in the text. We've got two biblical grounds. Some would say maybe perhaps there are others because we have those two. I'm pretty sure that those are the only two I can find. And uh, most people do not get a divorce over those grounds. But when a divorce takes place, it is a binding contract also. It is, once it happens, it's done. Uh, and I can demonstrate that from Deuteronomy 24 and other passages in the Bible. But that's not where I want to go with this. I just want to show that this righteous man is wrestling in his heart with what to do. You see, life sometimes has sticky issues. You ever notice that? Sometimes life is really complicated. He loves this woman. He wants to do the right thing. She appears to have been unfaithful. And he's thinking about divorcing her. But in the process of trying to wrestle with all this, he wants to do it quietly. He wants to have a cordial divorce relationship. Joseph, did you know that God does the miraculous? But after he had considered this whole idea of a divorce and everything, an angel appeared to him in a dream. Now, the angel appeared bodily or physically to Mary, but for Joseph, the angel appears in a dream to tell him what God wants him to know. God manifests and reveals himself in so many ways, in all of creation, in Jesus Christ, in the Word of God. He, he does in providence. He, God manifests himself everywhere. The only place we authoritatively know what he is saying is in the Holy Bible. It's where I go and can say authoritative. The list is what, the God, what, what God says. God appeared in his case in a dream and says to him, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Well, wait, that's part of the, the marriage process. You, uh, first you're pledged, and then you have the ceremony where then after it you take your wife home and, and you live together. He said, like, don't be afraid to do the ceremony. Don't be afraid to get married in what we consider a marriage because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. It's miraculous. Miracles actually have three parts. There's three parts to every miracle. The first part is it takes the mighty power of God. One of the words used to describe a miracle is dunamis. We get dynamite from that. It means God is doing something extraordinary. In fact, it is an extraordinary operation of God's everyday providence where he holds everything together. But he, in an extraordinary way, does something like Normally, you can't walk on top of water when it's not frozen. <laughs> you sink. Ordinarily, people die and stay dead. 
But in a miracle, God operates his universe in an extraordinary way where he made Jesus walk on top of water, where he made the dead to rise again. Ordinarily, virgins do not conceive. But in an extraordinary operation of God running his universe, he exerts this power that the power of the Most High that overshadowed her and she conceives. The second part is it's always a sign. God is saying something. In fact, we're going to see in the next couple of verses that God was saying something here. He was speaking and saying, this is my Messiah. This is the anointed one. This is the Savior. And so there's a sign. And the third part is it's always a marvel. People go, wow. When Jesus performed his, his miracles, they were all in awe. It always gets a response. When God does something miraculously, it gets a response. The person goes, wow. Or, in the other case, their heart is so hardened that seeing the same miracles, those that did not believe took up stones to try to stone Jesus. Miracles, you never stand neutral. And so, this angel is saying the miraculous has happened and you can't stand neutral on this. You're either for it or against it. Joseph, did you know that your stepson, because you are not the father. God is the father. This is God the son. Did you know that your stepson will be the savior of the world? She will give birth to a son, a son, a male child, and you'll give him the name Jesus. We touched on this last week just a little bit. The name Jesus is actually Yeshua or Joshua. It's a common Hebrew name. In fact, we have a book of the Bible called Joshua. It's a very common name. And it means Jehovah saves. And he says, you're going to name him Jesus because he will save. Salvation is the work of God rescuing us from our fallen condition. Everything God does to rescue us from our fallen condition is part of salvation. Now imagine for a moment you're, a, you're a, a fireman and there's a fire and you get there and there's somebody inside and they're screaming for help and you put on your gear and you go marching in and by the time you get there, the person is already gone. And you pull them out, were you the savior? No, not at all. Did you make a valiant effort? Yes, you did. But you did not save. Now, suppose another fire, you go in, the same thing happens, and this time you get there in time, you pull the person out, and they're alive. You are their Savior because you rescued them. This child will save his people. His people. It's very interesting here that he says his people. We would expect he's going to save the world. The world, his salvation is broad enough for all people. But those who really get saved, truly saved, are only those who are his people. If you don't appropriate by faith and believe in Jesus Christ personally, even though there's a fireman that's come in and can save, you'll perish in your sins because you must believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God in order to be rescued. You must be his people to be saved because he saves his people from their sins. Sin is not a popular topic today, I know. The word sin means when you miss the mark, when you fall short. Coming in second place isn't good enough. You fell short. You fell short. Some people, you say the standard's really high. God says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And all fall short. Some come pretty close. Yeah, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, you know, those kind. And then there's some that come eh, pretty close, in the middle. Some, you know, they're just going the opposite way. But the truth is we all fall short, and we all need someone to rescue us from the consequences of falling short. Jesus is the Savior who rescues us from all of our failures. And he imputes to us, he puts to our account his righteousness so that the standard is so high, I'm there because I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior and God accepts me as perfect, totally forgiven, pardoned of all my wrong because 
I have Jesus, my Savior, who has saved me from my sin. Not only has he saved me from my sin, but when you're saved, you're always saved to something. This is the best part. I am saved from death to life, from hell to heaven, from not with God to being with God to forgiveness. I get everything. In fact, the Bible will so far say everything that is Jesus's now becomes mine. Everything. Because Jesus is now my brother and I share in everything that he has. Isn't that awesome? He'll be your savior. Now this all fulfills a prophetic word and this all took place to fulfill what, what the Lord had said through the prophet. And Isaiah, just before the angel, the part that, that I, I, the angel didn't quote, just before this it says, and this shall be a sign unto you. Miracles are a sign. This shall be a sign unto you. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. One day I was working, this is years ago, I'm working at the Detroit News on the loading dock. I, I loaded the papers that then went out to all the stands and all the paper stations. And, and, uh, and I, I was really an obnoxious Christian. I was kind of like in your face with Jesus. And I had this uh, little button on, uh, uh, that I made that says, Jesus saves. And uh, the guy said to me, um, I'm loading with, he said, uh, you got the wrong kid. I said, what are you talking about? And he pointed to my button. He said, you got the wrong kid. I said, what do you mean you got the wrong kid? This guy was Jewish. He said, his name's going to be Emmanuel. His name's going to be Emmanuel. He said, you got the wrong kid. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Emmanuel means God with us. You're translating the words God with us as a name, but it's a sentence. He's God with us. Jesus, who is Jehovah who saves, becomes God with us. He's with us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This was God walking in a human body, united with that humanity. He, he's the, this is God who's going to go to the cross and die for us. This is God who, in, in the book of Acts, says, God, God who died for us. He's so united in that nature that God, I said, no, this was God with us. Jesus is God with us. That's exactly what the prophet is saying, saying, hey, which the angel is saying, which God was saying. There's a change. God says this to the angel because he said it already to the prophet and he's now saying it to you, Joseph. This is the sign the child she's going to bear. That's going to be God in the flesh. God in the flesh. So how do you please God? Well, when, the, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. He did it. You know, I often throw up there that Nike swoosh. Because before Nike, there's the scriptures. And the scriptures have this expression, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Joseph just does what the angel of the Lord commanded. And he took home, oh, he followed the ceremony. He took her home. He believes that God, what God said in that dream. And he took her home and he had, had no union with her until after she gave birth. And he gave the name Jesus, Jehovah saves, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Mary, what do you, did you know? Joseph, did you know? And my question is, so what do you know? What do you know? Do you know that God still works in mysterious ways? You cannot put God in a box. You can't. He works outside the box. We move and live and have our being within God. He supersedes all space. He's outside the box. He works in mysterious ways. God wants you to make right decisions, right choices. Joseph was wrestling with this, and we just finished the book of James. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it to you liberally. God is in the business of helping us make right decisions. We just need to trust in him. 
he's wrestling with this, he's wanting to do what is right, and God intrudes in space and time with a, a dream. I don't know, maybe in space and time you're wrestling with a decision, you don't know what to do, and it'll be a preacher, it'll be a sermon, or maybe it'll be a friend, or, or maybe it'll be somebody who doesn't even know the Lord. who will say something really profound and you'll know that God put that in their mouth just for you. God wants you to do the right thing, make the right choice. God does the miraculous. God does the miraculous. At any moment in time, he can supersede all of our normal, usual, ordinary operations of his providence. And he can run his universe in an extraordinary way that makes us stand in awe and say, God is God the Most High. So what do you know? Do you know God's Son saves His people? Do you know Him as your Savior? Have you come to that place where you, you're confronted with my failures and you say, God, I need you to save me from my failures. I need you to be my Lord, my Master, my God. I confess it with my mouth. I believe it in my heart. And the text says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God will save you. And then a little later, just a, a verse or two beyond that, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I confess, I believe, and I call. I, I don't pull my cell phone out and dial heaven. It's called a prayer. I just pray and I say, Lord, save me. It's that simple. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the heart, the faith, the confession, and that you're calling on him. So what do you know? Do you know that God's son is God with us, that he's with us? Paul in Ephesians says, he dwells in my heart by faith. My body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit and God resides within me as Jesus was God the Son united with humanity. God invades me so that in Peter it says, I am a partaker of the divine nature. Because of the presence of God, he's within me. The moment I accept Christ, he is God with us. Do you have that? And yes, you can please God. Did you know that? You can please God. You just do what he says. And God is pleased. It's not hard. You get in the word, you read it, you find out what he wants, and you do it. And God is pleased. Let's pray. Father in heaven, perhaps there's someone here today that says, you know what, my life has not been pleasing to you. I've not been doing what you, say, say, what you have said. I've been resisting you. I've never called on you. I've, you you've, I've never confessed you as my Lord and Savior. I, I haven't believed from the depth of my heart and my being that you came into the world to, to save me. But right now, I'm repenting of all that. I'm turning away from all of that. And I'm going to call on you and say, Lord, save me because I believe in my heart and I will confess you as my Savior and Lord. Father, we know if someone would just pray and say, Lord, save me. You'll know exactly what's in their heart, what they feel, what they mean, that you will save them. Do that right now. Perhaps we've been wandering away and we're thinking, man, life is so bad. Times are so tough. God must not be blessing me. And we know that's not true. Mary was blessed and times were tough. Blessings come from God. Tough times come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Help us hang on to the blessings that come from you, O Lord. This I pray in Jesus' name.